All right, brethren, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel 12. Verse 15. 2 Samuel 12, 15. Due to David's sin with Bathsheba, through Nathan the prophet, the Lord told David that the child shall surely die. We pick up here in verse 15, and it says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Now notice what he did after the departure of this child. And this is our subject, after the departure of loved ones. Notice what he did here, verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now there's a lot that could be preached from this passage, but I want to focus just on what David did after the departure of his loved one. David had fasted and mourned, could not be comforted, but then when the child died, he arose washed himself, changed his apparel, and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. He worshipped. And he said, when he was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought who could tell God will be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he's dead. And he said, wherefore should I fast? Why, why should I keep mourning and fasting? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. This is the holiday season. It's come upon us, and it's a time of joy during this time. But this is one of the most difficult times of the year for people who have lost loved ones. It's a difficult time of the year. And I want to preach this for, you, for those that, that have loved ones who have departed. But also, it's not only for for them, this, the things I'm going to say here hold true in most any trial that we suffer. Now, it's easy to speak on a subject like this if one hasn't recently suffered such a loss or they're not in a heartbreaking trial. I've heard messages preached before, and, and it was a little hard for me to receive it because it seemed like the preacher either was not in a trial or had not recently been through a trial, and so it was a little difficult to receive. So just for the sake of anybody that might hear this and thinks I'm being insensitive or, or don't know what I'm talking about here, it's only been not quite three months since the Lord took my dad home, and, um, and we've all been in a great trial for the past four years, so... I think this will be a word that would be good for all of us. 
Now, first of all, in the scripture, the Lord tells us there is a time to weep and a time to mourn. He says in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. It's not unnatural, it's not irreligious or, or unfaithful to mourn when somebody you love departs this life or when we suffer a heartbreaking trial. It would be callous not to, and it would be callous to condemn somebody who, who did weep at the loss of a loved one. But those that are born of the Spirit of God, we mourn, we weep, but not, not like other people, not like the unregenerate. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, concerning brethren that have died, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We do mourn. We do, we do shed real tears. But we do so with our hope in the Lord Jesus. And we have a good hope in him. It's difficult to tell what the case was with Jacob. I've read this and read commentaries. But when, whenever Jacob thought that Joseph had died, when they, his brothers came and said he'd been eaten by a wild beast. It's hard to tell exactly if this was an inordinate sorrow or if it was just, he just saying, I'm going to be sorrowful the rest of my days. It's hard to tell, but this is what, what Joseph, I mean, uh, Jacob said. It says, Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his loins, mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down to the grave uh, unto my son mourning. And thus his father wept for him. But knowing God's sovereign and knowing that, that God takes, takes our loved ones, knowing that he's appointed the time, faith resigns to God's will. We, we, as painful as it is in, in whether it be the death of a loved one or it be uh, some severe trial, you simply submit to the will of the Lord. You know the Lord is working it, and you know that he did it. But a believer can certainly become overcome with anguish of spirit. And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. Whenever the Lord sent Moses to preach the gospel, oh, to, to declare to the children of Israel that he was bringing them out of Egyptian bondage, you remember how Pharaoh made their life more bitter. He, he made their work harder. He required more bricks, and he, he didn't give them straw that they needed, and it made their life more bitter. And it says, Moses spake unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. They couldn't hear. They couldn't hear what Moses said. In fact, they, they blamed Moses for their for their work becoming more bitter, and told him, just leave us alone. Don't even, don't even come and speak. We see another example in Job. And Job, you know, all the stuff that he went through, lost all his family, and then uh, just the, the boils and all that he had with his physical health. And Job said, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And sometimes it's just that way. Sometimes we are overcome with sorrow. That, that's just, just how it is. We, we can't hear the word of the Lord, and we start to complain in bitterness of our soul. And that, that's just... If we didn't have a sin nature, that wouldn't be, but we do, and that's the case. We have to cry out sometimes and say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, because that's really what it is. But for, for the children of Israel, and, for, and looking at Job and, and many other examples of believers in Scripture, here's the thing that we learn from them is that God's grace towards his people does not change. His grace toward his people does not change. He didn't choose us because of something in us, and his grace doesn't change. God purposed and promised to deliver every elect child that he chose. He purposed it. He promised it. 
And that's what he did. It says in Isaiah 63, 9, in all their affliction, talking about the children of Israel, but this is so of all God's elect. It says in all their affliction, he was afflicted, the Lord. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Our Lord Jesus came, came and took flesh, and he bore our infirmities, and he bore our sicknesses, laid down his life on the cross, and he, and he accomplished the justification of his people. There is no way... Any sinner can enter God's presence unless we've been justified from all our sin and made righteous, made, made holy as God is holy, righteous as God is righteous, or God will not receive us. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished. He fully satisfied justice for his people. He didn't do that for people that were strong in faith and believed him. He did that for people who were yet dead in sins, many of us, and, and uh, who despised him and rejected him. Grace is, grace is grace. Grace is not based on anything in us. And so, having come to where we are and walked where we walked, our Lord Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched with the things we're touched with, and he pities his children remembering that we are dust. That's why when the children of Israel mourned and they were in anguish of spirit and they couldn't hear Moses, that didn't change the Lord's purpose. That didn't change his promise to deliver them. He delivered them. And brethren, when uh, he came to Lazarus' tomb, the reason our Lord groaned within himself is because Martha and Mary groaned within themselves. He was touched with their feeling of their infirmities. He wept because they wept. So whatever... We suffer, he knows, he's touched with it, and he cares for his people. Our Lord Jesus Christ cares for his people. Even when we're filled with unbelief because of sorrow, even when we're overcome with anguish of spirit, if the trial is so bitter, whatever it is, he tells you, cast, cast all you care on him, for he careth for you. That's what the Lord says. Now, it's easy to talk about faith when times are good, you know, but you let, you let a loved one be taken or you let the trial go on and be very bitter and become more bitter and let it go long enough. And it's a whole different story then. It's a whole different story. Brethren can become overcome with sorrow. That's just all there is to it. But don't ever forget this. Our Savior's grace is sovereign grace. It's free grace. His love is unchangeable. It, he's not going to turn from those he's everlastingly loved. He will not. He will not. Now, he gives us faith, and he requires that, that we believe his Son. But this is so important to realize, brethren, God's purpose and His grace, though He does give faith, though He does say that it's necessary to have faith in the Lord Jesus, God's grace and the fulfillment of that grace in us does not depend upon us, and it doesn't even depend upon our faith in Him. If that were so, brethren, we would perish. There would be many times we would perish. But the Scripture says if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He will restore faith. He will bring you to believe him. He, he, will, he will ease the sorrow. But it's not dependent upon us, and it's not dependent upon our faith. He's going to work his purpose even when we don't believe. The triune God entered into a covenant to save us from ourselves, to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sins, to save us from this world, from the devil, and from every enemy, death being the last enemy. He entered covenant to do this, and the Lord Jesus bound himself by an everlasting covenant that he would save his people, that he would bring each one to the Father, perfect in his perfection, righteous and holy by him, in him, and present us to the Father, and he will not lose one. Our Savior will not lose one. So 
Your deliverance is sure. Your redemption is sure. You've been redeemed at the cross, every one of God's elect have, and your redemption out of this world into God's presence is sure, but it's not sure because of us. It's sure because of our surety. It's sure because Christ is the Savior. It's sure because salvation is by God's sovereign, unchangeable love and grace. That's why our salvation is sure. That's why it's sure. So there's a time to mourn. And, and we can become over, over, uh, over much sorrowful. And we can, we can be in anguish of spirit so that we just simply cannot hear. But the Lord will save. He will save his people. Now, the second thing I want to look at here is what should we do when we are full of sorrow? When you're mourning uh, the loss of a loved one or you're in the trial and you're sorrowful, what should we do? Just exactly what David did. Verse 20, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Now you know David's heart was still breaking. He just, the child just died. His heart was, and that's why the servants were so perplexed and they said, you know, as bad as he, he the shape he was in when the child was alive, they thought when this child dies, no telling how David's going to vex himself. And so they were perplexed that when the child actually did die, when most people would have been so sorrowful at that point, even more so than before, David got up off his face, washed his clothes, changed, washed his face, changed his clothes, and he went to the house of the Lord and worshiped the Lord. Now, if your heart is sorrowful, if your soul is troubled, that's the best thing you can do. That is the very best thing you can do. Never let sorrow, never let the trial keep you from assembling together with God's people under the preaching of the gospel. Never let it happen. God promised to save his people through the preaching of his dear son. He's going to save through the preaching of the gospel. And he's going to save us through it. And he's going to keep saving us through it. And he's going to keep saving us through the preaching of the word. This is how he's going to comfort. This is how he's going to restore faith and revive you and, and, and keep you looking to Christ and build you up in the faith. It's through the preaching of his word. Christ speaking into our heart. That's how he's going to do it. This is the means whereby he regenerated us at the beginning, and it's the means whereby he's going to keep on reviving his people and keeping us walking by faith. It's through this word. Another thing to do is read the word. Read the word of God. Whenever you, uh, I remember I was, I was uh, in like a summer of 2021, uh, every time I would become sorrowful, um, I dropped down and do some push-ups every time. And, and I got to where I would stop and read a scripture. And I would just have a scripture to go to and just read something. It didn't have to be a lot. Just read a verse or sometimes it would just be a phrase or two. And sit and meditate on that word. Go to a scripture like Isaiah 53 that you're familiar with. And read about how our Redeemer accomplished the redemption of his people. And really sit and think about how that he, the Lord says that he justified his people. And how that he accomplished the redemption of his people. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. From eternity he wrote our names in the Lamb's book of life. That's what this book tells us. This book holds the consolation for his people. He wrote our names in the Lamb's book of life. And this is what our Lord promises. That's, and that's, this is what you, you read his word and look for his precious promises. And think on those promises. And this is what the Lord has promised right here. He said in Isaiah 49, 15, he said, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. 
Behold, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. I have you surrounded. I have your names on the palms of my hand. Engraven, he said. And he's speaking about the nail prints in his hands whereby he suffered as the substitute of his people. He made this promise in Malachi 3.17, They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. That's God's promise. You know why? You know why he will spare his people as a man spares his son that served him? Because God the Father's son served him. And he served him in perfection, and he did that in place of his people. These are promises God's given us to, to are food for our soul. When we're weak, when we're sorrowful, when we're in anguish of spirit, it's these promises God's given. Our Lord comes, comes uh, to you, and he speaks a word in season by the Spirit, by that still small voice, and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. You're going to have trouble in the world, but in me you'll have peace. He said, I've overcome the world. And brethren, you've overcome the world in our Lord already. And he will see to it that we overcome whatever our Lord sovereignly brings to pass in this world. He will see to it we overcome it. Because we already have in the Lord Jesus. Another thing to do, go to the house of the Lord hear the gospel, read his word, meditate on the, on the promises that he's made in his word. And another good thing to do is, is, is fellowship with brethren. Call up a brother or sister, not to talk about the trouble. You, you, some of you were so gracious and kind to talk to me when I was going through through my trouble in the beginning and I just sometimes you can't talk about anything else and I and I get that and sometimes brethren just need to you just need to listen and they just need to talk I have a few brethren now that call me and and they don't need me to talk they don't need me to answer them they just need me to listen that's all and I know what that's like because I've been the one that needed to do the talking but call up a brother or sister and ask them this. Ask them, remind me of the good news of the gospel. Just remind me of the good news of the gospel. And then just listen. You know, any brother or sister in Christ be happy. If you called them and said that, they'd be happy to, to start speaking to you about the good news of what Christ has accomplished for his people. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And that's how. That's how. Most of all, most of all, above everything else, be always casting, present tense, casting all you care upon the Lord, for he careth, present tense, he careth for you. That's what Peter said. Always be casting all you care upon the Lord for He cares for you. That's in the present tense. We're going to always have care. It's hard to do that. You know, we sing that song, cast your bird upon the Lord and leave it there. Do you find that that is just near impossible to do? It is. It's, it's a tough thing to do. But you be casting all you care upon the Lord. Listen to how David, let, let's go read this in Psalm 30. And I want you to hear how David did this. He cast his care on the Lord, and I want you to see how the Lord cared for him. Psalm 30, and look at in verse 10. Just one verse here, verse 10, he cries out and he says, uh, Psalm 30, verse 10, he says, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Isn't that, a good, isn't that a good cry? Isn't that a good prayer? You know, when you're really, really suffering, that's about all you can say. And that's all you, that's all you need to say. Help, Lord. And look what the Lord did for him. He cast his care on the Lord, and look what the Lord did. Verse 11, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. 
Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. And here's why the Lord will do this. To the end that my glory may sing praises to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. That's why the Lord's saving us, brethren, is so we sing praise to him. So we thank him. So we glorify him. But you see there, that's what the Lord Jesus said he came to do. I came to give them the oil of joy for, the, for sadness. He takes off the sackcloth in the morning and the garments of sadness and he clothes you in his righteousness and he turns your morning into dancing. Peter said, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And that word due time is so very important. It's so very important. That's the Lord's time. And the Lord's time's the right time. He said, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It takes humility to wait on the Lord. It takes humility to wait on the Lord. Pride wants the Lord to work right now. Moses prayed for Miriam, his sister, and he said, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Heal her now, he said. And we're prone to think that if someone doesn't answer us or come to our aid right away, then the Lord waits. Do you remember when they sent word to him about Lazarus and they said, they said Him whom thou lovest is sick. And listen to this from John 11, verse 5. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved them. And when he had heard, therefore, that Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He waited because he loved them. He waited till Lazarus died because he loved them. Why did he do that? He did it so that he could go there and show them he is the resurrection and the life. He did it to teach them the gospel because he loved them. Why do we preach and then pray and then wait on the Lord to save? Why, why doesn't a faithful preacher of the gospel preach the gospel and then, and then you know, beg sinners to, to come to the front and, and, and you know, play sad songs and everything else and try to twist your arm into making a profession of faith. Why do we pray, uh, preach, and then pray and then wait on the Lord? Why do we do that? Why do we preach and pray and wait on the Lord when brethren are in trials? Same reason. So that your faith should stand not in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. The Lord is the only one who can save us out of our sorrow, save us out of our trials, save us out of our sin. He's the only one that can do it. You go into the house of the Lord, this is where He's promised to give you His Word, whereby He's going to comfort His people and save His people. You go to His Word and you read His Word, this is where He's promised He'll give you the consolation and the comfort and the medicine for your healing. Call up brethren, have brethren, and just ask them, just, just put me in remembrance of what the Lord has done. Put me in remembrance. And then cast all your care on the Lord, knowing He cared for you, and humble yourself under His mighty hand, and wait on Him to exalt you in due time. He will make us wait sometime to show us He's the Lord, to show us He's our life, to show us we can't do a thing without Him. And that's to make our faith stand in His power rather than in the wisdom of men. That's why He does that the way He does it. His time is the right time. And you know what Psalm 31.15 says, My times are in His hand. Our times are in his hand. He came into this world. You know when he came into this world? Galatians 4.4 4 says he, Christ came into the world when the fullness of the time had come. 
Now, if he came at the precise right time and redeemed his people from our sin, he knows the precise best time to come to us in our trouble and lift us up. He knows the time. So wait on him, trust him, and patiently wait on him. Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. All of it. That means all your sorrow, all your anguish of spirit, all your sins, all your weaknesses, all your children's care, all your loved ones' care, all the care that it comes about in the trial. If you could cast your eternal care into his hand and trust him to save you for, from, from the curse of the law and from the sins of your flesh and save you eternally, if you could cast all that care into his hand and trust him to save you, whatever other care you have, you can trust him to care for you. Now that's so, brethren. Now lastly, if you have a loved one who has departed, and we all have or we will, Another thing that you can do is this. You think on what that departed saint is enjoying right now. You think about what they're enjoying right now. David said, verse 23, he said, Now he's dead, wherefore should I fast? Why well, be sorrowful now? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Uh, you know, uh, and I'll say this too, because I, 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 you know, I told you about my uncle, and I have an uncle who I love dearly that didn't know the Lord, that died after my dad died. And, uh, you know, I can't bring my father and my uncle back, but I will go to the grave. And I will go into eternity. And so will you. But for a believer that's departed, this is what the Lord told John, and he told John to write this down for you and me. He said, write this. <laughs> Put it in the book so that my people can read it. He wrote Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Since the Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, God's people shall never die. They'll never die. Our Lord said that at Lazarus' grave. He said, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? It's only those, these uh, bodies of clay that are going to die. They got, they're going back to the dust. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what the scripture tells us. Immediately. Death is God giving us what we've been praying for many times throughout our life. How many times have you prayed that the Lord would deliver you from the body of this death? That he would deliver you from your sins? Well, for the believer that passes from this life, they've been completely, totally delivered from the body of this death into perfect joy, perfect peace forever. How many times have we prayed to be delivered from our troubles? You, you, you prayed over and over, Lord, please deliver me from my trouble. Well, that departed believer is delivered from all their trouble, never again to experience trouble. Only joy and only peace. How many times have we prayed for God to make us more like Christ? Lord, grow me in your grace. Make me more like my Redeemer. Well, that departed saint is perfectly conformed to the Lord Jesus. He's just like him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be like him. Think on those things about that loved one that's departed. As for me, David said, 
I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. David said of his son, or of the child, he said, he shall not return to me. And that, that believer that's departed, you don't want him to return to you. You wouldn't want them to return to you. And they wouldn't want to return to you. <laughs> they enjoying where they are so much they wouldn't want to return. But I shall go to him. And you have that to think about. You're going where they are. You're going where they are. I pray that any of my brethren who are mourning in a little while... Remember this, in a little while, you're going to go where that departed loved one has gone. You're going to go where, they're, where they've gone. Just a little while. We won't be married in glory. Uh, married couples in this life won't be married in glory. But we'll know each other. You know, when they were in the Mount of Transfiguration, they knew Moses and Elias. There they appeared and, and they recognized who they were. The Lord said that, that we'll sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We're going to know who they are. In a little while, you'll go to that departed loved one and you'll know them in glory. Just wait on the Lord. These are all things that we have to look forward to, and I do hope they would make us be comforted. Whenever Marvin and Glenda were here, she told me about a hymn that she once sung at her funeral, and I got her to get, give me a copy. She mailed me a copy of it. I don't think I've, I've read this to you, but let me read you the words to this hymn. Oh, call it not death when loved ones depart and leave us in gloom and sadness of heart. Although we have lost, to them it is gain. They've entered their home with Jesus to reign. It would not be right to ask their return and come back to earth for their race is run. They've left this old world and now are at rest for they're just gone to be with the blessed. Oh, call it not death, but life just begun. The river is past. Their work here is done. The Spirit set free has reached the blessed shore where sorrow and pain and sin are no more. The place our dear Lord has gone to prepare is all that the soul could wish over there. To leave this old world of sadness and strife and be with our Lord, yes, this is real life. Oh, call it not death, but that blessed sleep, and never again to wake up and weep. The morning shall come, the body shall rise, and meet our dear Lord somewhere in the skies. Then cheer up, dear ones, who sadly do weep, for happier are they in Jesus they sleep. Yes, they are now free from sickness and strife. Then call it not death, but eternal life. I pray the Lord will bless that and comfort any who are troubled. Call somebody if, if, you, if you don't have these Sorrows, call somebody, one of your brethren, during the holidays and just talk to them. It'll do you good and it'll do them good. All right, let's go to the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, our God and our Savior, so wise, too wise to make any errors, so powerful, too powerful not to accomplish your purpose. Lord, we do thank you that you have purposed and ordered your covenant and made it sure in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. We pray, Lord, for our brethren who are, who are sorrowing over missed loved ones and pray for our brethren who are yet suffering in the trial Lord, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. I pray you use us to speak a word in season. I pray, Lord, that in your time, in the due time, that you would lift them up, that you would make their faith to stand in your power. 
Help us, Lord, to be helpers for one another. And don't let us get in the way of what you're teaching, what you're accomplishing every hour of every day. And Lord, we do thank you that you've given us this sweet, sweet gospel of accomplished redemption to comfort our hearts no matter what it is we suffer, Lord. This, this word is effectual for anything and everything that we suffer in this life. It's the one message that saves. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given your Son and it's all in, in Him and our blessed Redeemer. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our brethren here. Thank you for the work you've done here. Lord, let us remember you accomplishing your purpose. Your will's being done, and you shall save your people. Help us to remember that. Help us to remind each other of that. And forgive us, Lord, our unbelief and our, our inordinate sorrow. And keep us, Lord, ever looking to Christ. It's in his name we ask it. Amen.